Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is the uh, first, the chief ed editor and then a chief executive of uh, Penguin Books, has played a decisive role in shaping the contours of uh, certainly English language publishing uh, in India for over 15 years. Uh, more recently, he's sort of jumped to the other side of the fence uh, with a novel of his own, uh, which is uh, already making ripples. Uh, there are uh, plenty of rumors around about its uh, huge successes, uh, the huge advances that uh, he has been paid, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, David Davidev. David, Thank how you. large is the advance that you've been paid? The one thing that I don't think anyone is ever going to hear, uh, but I say to myself, uh, my retirement package is locked in. So, um, it is, I mean, I think, I think more than the advance, I think what has um, really enthused me has been the reception of publishers around the world, really, um, in a book which I wrote very much for India. You know, it was, it was a book about, and not only just India, things that really grabbed me about my own sort of upbringing, the place of my heart, if you like, you know, uh, boyhood, places that I sort of um, thought nobody would be interested in. I wrote that book for myself mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. which is why it's success, well, success because nobody's read it, but uh, it's, uh, the impression it's created in the minds of people who uh, seem to be looking forward to it um, is very gratifying. Is it too early to tell us what the the book is about? Is that sufficiently in the public domain? Um, yeah, I think it is. I mean, it's, it's a family story, really. It's about three generations of a South Indian family, um, a Tamil family, to narrow it down even further, um, starting in 1899 and ending in 1946, um, which to me is a fascinating period of Indian history, especially in the South, because everyone knows about the great struggles in the North, you know, and Gandhiji and Partition and Jinnah and all of those things, you know, uh, Jallianwala Bagh. But what, what was happening in the South mm -hmm. in that period? It just seemed quiet, nothing was going on. You know, the Madras presidency was quiet. But if you delve a little deeper, uh, get under the skin, there's an amazing amount going on. So that was what sort of initially got me interested. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, some elements of your own sort of, you know, family, I mean, what they were doing and family histories and so on. So it's just a sort of you know, saga. You, you mentioned this aspect of underneath the skin. Uh, you know, a narrative has a story in, mm -hmm. in, in any book to work, like any film or, or any piece of narrative, is, is the unfolding of the story. Uh, but what usually sort of drives the creator of the story is, you know, the story is structure. Sure. It's because there's, that there's something more that, that, that sort, of, you know, sort of simmering inside that he wants to express, that yep. he wants to say. So what is it that the book or, or your effort in articulating <coughs> is saying? Well, you know, I mean, when you look at all of us, you know, urban, middle-class people who've had a certain kind of education, a certain kind of aspirations, whatever, you think about it, there seems to be a kind of sameness about this class, you know. And I remember sort of talking to somebody at one of these jelly parties, and I said, look, when you think about it, most of us are not more than two or three generations removed from our village, and a life which is completely, unimaginably different from what we're leading today, you know. Um, so the progression here is from a village to a small town to um, a third part, which is sort of very British, because that was the time of the Raj. And the book originally had a fourth part, which is going to take place in a big city. So I, I, you I just already have your sequel in place. Yes, I already <laughs> have my sequel in place. But essentially, it is this movement on the part of a certain kind of Indian, you know, across a span. So. I chose 1899 because it seemed to me the edge of a century. And I think the lots of things which come, I mean, when all of us, when 2000 was coming up, I mean, the kind of hysteria which greeted it. So I just wanted to see how it went. And it was going to end in 1999, 2000. And I just said, um, it, there was a natural ending um, in 1946. So that's, a, that, that's, that's the flow of the book. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess that you're going to have to get used to this when the book is out and promoting it and, 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 and the same kinds of questions. But there seems to be sort of some ground that I need to get over with. And, and, and uh, this has been widely reported in the press. So forgive the, uh, the repetition of the mm -hmm. questions. Um, you know, why the pseudonym when you, when you sent ah. out uh, the book? Well, you know, two very basic reasons. Um, the publishers in London and New York, which is where it's been sold initially, we haven't offered it in Europe yet. I know most of these guys, you know, because uh, I've been working with them for 15 years, because Penguin and any major publisher is interlinked. I mean, this is a small community, really, when you come down to it. So in the first place, I didn't want them to be embarrassed if they didn't like it. 
that they could say no. And the second place, we try really, really hard mm -hmm. to get our books out mm -hmm. um, ar around the world. You know what I mean? The books that originate here. And I didn't want to give mm -hmm. myself an unfair advantage. It mm -hmm. just didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why I sent it out. Mm -hmm. And how did you arrive at the Jai Kumar? Uh, it's my middle name. It's an anagram. It's a kind of, uh, you know, it's a modification of my middle name. My middle name is Jai Sekran. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know. And there's this also the widely reported uh, in a role that uh, Vikram Sait uh, has played in this. Uh, and, and that he's sort of, you know, apart from encouraging you to mm -hmm. write the book over lunch in London, you know, mm -hmm. sort of as, as, as a matter of fact, to get out of the way, um, he's, you know, reportedly editing the book. Yeah. What, what does an editor do? Uh, well, I've had this argument with a lot of people, and having been an editor for 15 years, um, on very rare occasions, if a manuscript is appallingly bad, an editor rewrites. But otherwise, you're like a coach and cheerleader, you know, unlike in newspapers, where a sub actually sort of compresses stuff to fit the requirements of a newspaper, column inches and whatever. Here in publishing, mm -hmm. the, your main job is to get the writer's voice as powerfully and as beautifully um, polished as possible. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so sometimes very little work is required on a book. Mm -hmm. uh, and all you need to do is sort of point the writer in the right direction when he or she is going astray. Mm -hmm. And this is what an editor does. This is what Vikram did. I mean, I sent him the first 200 pages. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, look, if this does not work for you, I'm just going to put it away. I don't need to write a book at this point in my life. I'm doing a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So he encouraged me to continue. Mm -hmm. And then when 700 pages were done, he read every page and made his annotations, his notes, his criticisms, his mm -hmm. comments. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's what he did. And then he makes these notes and comments, and they come back to you, and then you decide to, you yeah. know, how to assimilate yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, that's the way it always works. Yeah. Also, always has the final say. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's the first time in the world, he'd, uh, first time in his life he'd done it, mm -hmm. and I really think he's one of the best writers in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. this was a great privilege, you know, to have mm -hmm. him sit there. You knew you were getting really top class, um, mm -hmm. um, what you may call it, um, advice. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. think about it: a commentator who's been a cricketer, mm -hmm. when he's describing somebody who's sort of doing something with a bat or a ball, I mean, there's that much more, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm legitimacy, if you like, mm -hmm. to what mm -hmm. uh, he's saying. So uh, Vikram mm -hmm. knew how it worked. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. What sort of uh, in, in encouraged you to, um, to, to write a book? Were you emboldened by the quality of work that you saw uh, around you and felt, well, you could do as well, if not better? Uh, was it just the, the need for catharsis, uh, self-expression? Uh, was it a, you know, a bit of vanity? Uh, what are the kinds of things um, that well, I mean, a bit of all that. But finally, I think you write because you have to. You know, the minute you start thinking, yeah, I'm going to get published here, there, I'm going to get this sort of review, I'm going to get that kind of money, I'm going to get this kind of fame, forget it. You know, um, it's easier with nonfiction because you have the end in sight. Fiction is a very dangerous tightrope. You know, I mean, it's a kind of urgent need, I suppose. I mean, we all have that when we're about 17 or 18 or 19. Unfortunately, most people don't get published at that age. But well, you wrote a book. Yeah, I wrote a book and threw it away, which was the <coughs> best thing that I could have done. You know, because these books are usually self-indulgent. They are sort of filled with a kind of desperation, which is not unique. You know, angst at that age, your, your circumstance might be slightly different, but I mean, they can get very boring, you know. Yeah. So, and they, as I say, they just go on for too long. It didn't take a lot of courage to, to throw away that you throw away something that you oh, spend so much time. Oh, I think a lot of people throw it away. I mean, if you have any sense whatsoever, you sort of keep it, show it to your grandchildren if you like. But otherwise, just just don't get it published unless you're a genius, and mm -hmm. that's a very overrated word. There's too few geniuses around um, these days. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, I think um, it's a combination of all three. I mean, I think if you didn't want your work to be read, you just write it and lock it up in your, in your chest of drawers, you know, I mean, why would you, or your writing bureau, you wouldn't want it out there. So you would like it to be read. Um, but I think the first and primary motivation should be, this is something I have to do. Mm -hmm. Is this something you have to do or something I have to say? Something I have to say. If you, do, if you didn't have anything to say, mm -hmm. I doubt that you could sustain, drive yourself over mm -hmm. 50,000 words, 100,000 words, 200,000 words. Mm -hmm. You know, you could do it for 5,000 words. But and one of the moments of sort of uh, uh, a book is a, is, is, is a large, uh, long-term enterprise. Uh, and and you, you've described your sort of obsession with it. You just mm. get involved and it just goes on. And it's an isolation. Mm. It isn't interactive. You aren't getting feedback. What is it that sort of uh, that keeps, keeps you going? I'm, I'm sort of trying to get a sense of the obsession 
uh, that drives a, an, an author to stay with it. And, and you abandoned uh, a, a second novel mm. midway, and this yeah. was your third shot at it. Yeah. And um, you know, you're obviously in the profession. There must have been some degree of, of, of nervousness mm -hmm. as, as to you know as, as to how the how, how the judge was going to be judged. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what was this the nature of this obsession? I think you need a support group. I mean, writing is probably the most lonely creative pursuit there is. Perhaps painting, if you're a violin virtuoso, you probably spend 18 hours a day practicing or something. But writing, you have nothing in front of you except a blank sheet of paper, a blank screen, and just yourself. And this is something that can drive people crazy. I mean, you have to be slightly crazed, I think, to write. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. To get yourself out of your ordinary pursuits and yeah. go off and do it. You know? And people call it obsession, I call it craziness. Yeah. Uh, and I think you have to have a very patient, enduring support team. In this case, my wife, who who labored through those two years, I can tell you, because she was actually doing it. I mean, she, she just had to sit there sort of, you know, dealing with this crazy guy. And Vikram. I mean, these are the only two people who knew about it. Vikram had one remove because he was sitting in London and he just get batches of, um, um, you know, the manuscript. But you need one or two people who are very patient with you. Um, and that's the only way you do it, because there are days when you don't want to write another word. You know, you say, I've, I've spent um, a year and a half, two years, three years, whatever, doing this. And the only thing at that point which drives you onward is all that work will be wasted, because if you have a half complete book or a three quarters complete book, you have no book. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still 100 sheets of paper. So what was your experience with the proverbial first blank page? Fortunately, I didn't have that problem. It, should, it had just been simmering in my head for so long. You know, it was the first 200 pages were, were a breeze, no problem. And then you had to sort of, it's like a marathon. You, know, it's, uh, you, you can either run 5,000 meters or you can sort of grit it out for 26 kilometers or whatever. You know, so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what happens now at this sort of this, this, this pregnant pause in a sense? Uh, the great public anticipation of the book, uh, there's the advance, there's a major publisher, but it isn't out in the world yet. What are your feelings? I'm still revising. I mean, my deadline is the 15th of March. And it normally takes between six to nine months to produce a book, you know, because you then the editors get to work. You know, um, they come back to you. The, the, the editors attached to publishing houses, they come back to you with your comments. So there's a little element of revising there. There's the cover to be done. There's publicity to be sorted out. So all these take time. And fortunately, I have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can just sort of, <coughs> you know, disappear into my real world, uh -huh. while the unreal world goes on, you know, side by side. Uh -huh. Well, let's get back to this sort of um, the real world. You were in your early 30s when you sort of took charge of uh, a major initiative in India, Penguin. It was an international uh, uh, a chain. Uh, what, was the, what was the mission that you felt? What were the objectives? Well, actually, I was, um, I say to myself, I was very young and foolish. I was, I'd never done this. I was 26 when I actually sort of uh, got into this. Um, my first publishing job, and um, I was sort of doing a course in elsewhere. And uh, the, the the person who actually sort of picked me was the then chairman of uh, Penguin, who was a bit of a visionary. I mean, he there's no idea, there's no reason he had to start a company in India, but there was Avik Sarkar here who was really keen on doing something, and he met a like mind, and the two of them got together and said, okay, we're going to do something. Mm -hmm. Who do they have? Who do they pick to run it? Somebody who's never done a sort of mm -hmm. job in publishing mm -hmm. ever before. I was a journalist in Bombay. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I came in and I fortunately had very few preconceived notions. Mm -hmm. Because this was more or less a blank slate. I mean, there's no real trade in general publishing as you, can, as you know it today. And I mean, there, there were some sporadic successes. But mainly there were brilliant educational publishers and that was it. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I bumbled around for a bit and sort of alienated some people, sort of made my mistakes, and then learned, fortunately, you know, for everyone including myself. Um, and that's how it took off. You know, we started very small. Our initial investment was 500,000 rupees. That was it, mm -hmm. you know, um, on the side of these two giant partners. I mean, mm -hmm. they just, so it was literally dipping their toe in the water. If it didn't work, sack David Ar, get <laughs> on with that life, you know, but um, fortunately it did. Now, what was David Ar's brief? Just make to it grow, a success yeah, commercially? Yeah, to, uh, yeah. Uh, what? to create a list mm -hmm. of the best Indian writing, both for India and the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. Mm -hmm. You know, and the option is between working for Newsweek magazine in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a kind of job, um, I mean, a feeler mm -hmm. from there, or coming and doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said it was, it's great to be very young, very naive, and very foolish. 
because you then sort of say, okay, I'll go and slay dragons rather than sit at a desk and sort of work on a secure job. Mm -hmm. Well, one has a sort of uh, uh, a romantic image of, uh, of a publisher uh, with, 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 with a huge uh, mission beyond making mm -hmm. uh, a success of a brand for its own sake. Uh, you know, working and identifying new talent and, and, and cultivating writers and creating new movements and literature and, and, and what have you. Uh, uh, to what degree uh, have, have you felt fulfilled in those terms uh, beyond making uh, success of Penguin as a brand and, and obviously with large turnovers, which you know, I'm sure have satisfied and delighted the right. people who put in those five lakhs right. and stuff? Right, right. Well, you know, I mean, um, there is a fair amount of ex exhilaration but also immense frustration um, because, you know, um, we're often the creatures of our environment and the Indian publishing and retail environment isn't in an ideal state, which, which isn't the case anywhere in the world, I guess. I mean, everyone always feels less than sort of happy with these sort of things. But I believe that what we're doing today will pay very rich dividends, say 15, 20 years from now when India will be the third largest publishing in um, English language environment in the world. You know, the middle class, the people who use English as the first language, no matter what your mother tongues are. I mean, that will reach critical mass, I think, 15 years down the line. So one generation more. So what we're doing here is we're building the foundations. You know, and uh, we're very happy with the way things have worked. I mean, today, we, if we can sell 10,000 copies of a book, 10 years ago, you could sell only 1,000 copies of a book. So in that way, the market is actually, we've actually help to be one of the key drivers of the market in our little narrow uh, segment of publishing. Um, what, have I, what do I feel beyond the, beyond the fact of just uh, making a brand work in this country? I think the personal satisfaction of offering very talented people who might otherwise have not written a book, may not have thought of working in publishing, given them an opportunity to sort of come and be part of this excitement. And also, I mean, the fact that everyone else is here now, you know, Harper Collins and Picador and, you know, Indian companies like Indian Inc. and uh, Ravi Dal, mm -hmm. suddenly there's a trade publishing mm -hmm. setup, environment. Mm -hmm. Suddenly publishing is sexy. Mm -hmm. Suddenly everyone feels, yes, if I want to write a book, I'm going to write a book. Mm -hmm. These are the things, these are the sort of intangibles which mm -hmm. you never sort of thought of when mm -hmm. we started out. Apart from the David Davidars and the uh, uh, Vikram Saits and the Amitabh Ghoshes and, and the big names in writing, uh, how far down the road do you think uh, uh, before sort of your, your average uh, Indian writer who gets published by Penguin can make a living uh, from writing? It's a very good question because, I mean, globally, it's only the top 1%, probably even less, who make a, writing, as they make a living exclusively from their writing. Fortunately, there, in other countries, the grants and age, you can go off and be a writer in residence, some corporation, will, uh, government will give you a grant to go and write a book, or you teach part time. You know, it's mm -hmm. which is why I mean I think it's it's it is I think almost a prerequisite that you must feel compelled to write, mm -hmm. unless you are uh, unless you are someone who writes for a movie studio or um, you know does work for an NGO or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is not w what we're talking about. I mean, you say you want to write a novel or a biography or a book that is being drawn from within yourself. I think it's fatal to think, okay, I'm going to get all these goodies at the end of it. One can't afford to think of the goodies. One has to do the work first. And so I think there will, uh, we already have a stage where the top 1% can make a living from their writing. But I suspect while the audience will get bigger, the money will get much better, domestic money, uh, compared to say what you could make as, I don't know, a working professional in TV, journalism, advertising, publishing. Um, it probably will be a long, long time before that 1% becomes 5% or 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what, what kind of criteria do you use when uh, a book or an author comes to you? Uh, you know, over the years you have, you have evolved uh, your publishing agenda to this as being extremely wide. Mm. Um, you know, not just fiction, you're looking at all kinds of books. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what kind of things do you, do you look for beyond the fact that the book will sell? Well, it's curious, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is the most objective business, well, I mean, all the creative businesses are subjective, the music industry, television, everything, you know. From the progenitor, if you like, the person who does the work, which is a very subjective business, to the uh, first assessor, who's a publisher, very subjective, to the reviewer, to the reader, to the buyer, all of these are subjective assessments. So there is no one norm. You know, um, 
But I think uh, someone described it as the difference between a good, good book and a good, bad book to explain. Mm -hmm. um, we who read a lot, you know, I mean, tend to look at, you can, you can subdivide it into mm -hmm. literary and commercial books, you know, books that work in the market and books mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. occupy the high moral ground, mm -hmm. if you like, the high ground. Mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> you can have a very poor literary novel which should be rejected out of hand. Mm -hmm. All these first novels mm -hmm. written at age 19, mm -hmm. which are more pretentious than good. Mm -hmm. So, but in, in the eyes of a readership, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's um, a, to write a you know, literary novel is probably a little bit more worthy than write mm -hmm. an outright sort of you know, romantic novel or a thriller, mm -hmm. no matter that everyone would like to write a book which sells a million copies. Mm -hmm. But it's damn tough to write a commercial novel as well. So I think a book needs to be good in every genre. Mm -hmm. You can't apply one yardstick across mm -hmm. every, every kind of discipline. You know, mm -hmm. Thriller writers write to a certain kind of book. Mm -hmm. A spiritual writer will write a certain kind of book. A uh, romantic writer will write a certain mm -hmm. kind of book. So you need to be omnivorous. As a publisher, you need to have read everything. Mm -hmm. You need to like everything. Mm -hmm. And you need to sort of measure each book by a different criterion. Uh, what kind of freedoms do, uh, do you have? Uh, you know, as, 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 as someone who reads a lot, um, uh, as, as, as a discriminating judge of good material, mm -hmm. and you just mentioned the literary novel that mm -hmm. may not sell. Would you publish uh, a literary novel that may not sell? Because yes. It's going to yes, I would. I would, but I wouldn't pack my list with literary novels which didn't sell because then we'd go out of business. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we, I think we try and stri achieve a balance. I mean, there are very few taboos because I think Penguin is a very, very firm believer in free speech right across the board. I mean, um, I was at a conference last year where someone said the Chinese government, for example, brought pressure to bear on the, ch the, the, uh, the then chairman. Mm -hmm. um, and they were looking for some licenses. They said, but if you publish this book, mm -hmm. it's going to be jeopardized. So he phoned the chief executive Pearson and said, what do I do? Mm -hmm. um, so she said, where's the problem? You publish the book. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are certain things that, I mean, there are no taboos, mm -hmm. except things that, in our wisdom, we believe are anathema to, um, to us. I mean, for example, sectarian books that foment sectarianism, you know, extreme right-wing books, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Books that, uh, perversion, maybe not. If a murderer wrote a book and asked us to publish it, mm -hmm. uh, an autobiography, would we publish it? I don't know. I don't what about so. bad taste? Bad taste is so subjective again. <laughs> <laughs> Some <laughs> of your publications have been. Sort yeah, of, uh, so, uh, so we shan't take names, yeah, but uh, I, uh -huh. I mean, I think, I think, um, bad. I mean, I don't think we'd sit, sit in judgment on that. You know, taste, mm -hmm. uh, aesthetic taste is, you know, so fluid. You know, Dickens was a commercial pop writer. Mm -hmm. He's still read a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think things like that one doesn't sit in judgment on, but things that, from our point of view. I mean, or from Penguin's point of view, because we're talking about one publishing firm, some other publishing firm might feel differently, but there's certain things that we simply won't do. Mm -hmm. All the rest is fair game. Mm -hmm. So how do you sort of, uh, a year later or two years later, um, do you sort of evaluate books as, as successes by sales, by reviews, by, um, well, we thought it was a great book, and we think it's a great book, but uh, the critics haven't noticed it, and, and, that's, and they're not very sort of wise, and the market hasn't noticed it, and maybe they will yet. Mm. Uh, how, how do you look at a... Sadly, um, in an ideal world, you keep a book in print forever because you believe in its worth. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are sales cycles, you know, a book slips through it, and we haven't got enough ma uh, hype going around it, we haven't sort of got enough copies into the bookshops, the book, books haven't sold through. Mm -hmm. At some point, the book goes off the list. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's tragic because there's so much investment, there's so many hopes, everything's sort of pinned on this. But that's, that's the name Do of the Do you have a percentage of, of uh, how many books you're able to sort of, you, you, you feel have been successes? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you, you pretty much can, can't afford to have more than 10% of your list failing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, today we publish 125 new books a year, mm -hmm. which means about 10 books can do less than what we hoped they would. And if you are a good publisher, I believe, you will know why those 10 books haven't worked. Some mm -hmm. of them you're publishing for the prestige of publishing them. Some of them you're publishing mm -hmm. because it's your, it's your way of giving back. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you're a successful business, you want to publish these books because you believe that if there are 200 readers for the book, they must read it, mm -hmm. you know. But, yeah, 10%. So it sort of seems almost uh, uh, an idyllic situation uh, to be a, a successful publisher who's 
who's got another successful publisher to publish his book. Uh, you're still, what, 42 years old? Yeah. Um, what do you look forward to next? What do I look forward to next? I think there's so much that can be done with Penguin. You know what I mean? And as I say, we're, we're constrained by things like the size of the market, the size of the number of people who use English as the first language. And there is a peculiar excitement to working in, a, in an industry where every single product is different. Mm -hmm. You know, every book is different. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, can, you can be taken to sort of highs by mm -hmm. people who, you know, whose minds are different from yours in the sense that their obsessions are different. Mm -hmm. But they're working at the highest pitch of their powers. And these are very smart, bright people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful to be in that. So um, hopefully I'll be able to sort of, you know, maybe I'll write another book. I, I have no idea. But well, uh, there's a sequel waiting there. Yeah. 